Dr. William Davis here, author of the Wheat Belly series of books and most recently Super Gut. I've been talking a lot lately about omega-3 fatty acids because despite 20-some years of uncertainty and uh, discrepant findings in clinical studies, it's now become very clear. Omega-3 fatty acids really do play a big role. But specifically, I want to focus on two studies that are really changing uh, how we think about the role of omega-3 fatty acids in preventing or even regressing or reversing coronary atherosclerosis. So I thought it'd be important to bring the findings of these two studies to your attention because it really changes the conversation. It's a real game changer for how we view coronary disease and how to best manage it and avoid such things as heart attack or the need for procedures like stent implantation or bypass surgery. But it helps to be reminded that omega-3 fatty acids from fish oil are food. They're a component of food. Even though the pharmaceutical industry has been busy trying to make convince us that it's a drug, it's not a drug. It's a component of food. And the reason I point that out is because foods typically are effective in health in gram quantities, not milligram quantities, a thousandfold less. So what if I told you eggs are good for you? And they are. Here we have an average large egg and it weighs 60 grams. But what if I told you we're going to have you get, get some eggs, a thousand milligrams or one gram? Will it provide much benefit? No, because it's too small a quantity. So with any component of food, we typically have to talk about gram quantities. And that's why some of the early studies were plagued by using low doses. But the whole conversation about the benefits of omega-3 fatty acids got their start when it was observed that populations that consume more seafood, such as the Inuit or Eskimos, uh, people in Japan and South Korea, had far fewer cardiovascular events. So the question was asked, is it due to the omega-3 fatty acids in, in seafood? Well, the first large-scale trial, I'm just running through this quickly. If you want more detail, see my other conversations uh, on YouTube or my podcast, Define Health. So the first large study to suggest that there was a reduction in cardiovascular events was the Gissi Prevenzioni trial, a, an Italian trial that did show about 10% reduction in cardiovascular events. But then a series of smaller studies came out that suggest there was no benefit. Well, even more recently, there have been several very large studies, the JELUS trial, 19,000 people, VITAL study, 25,000 people, REDUCE IT, 8,000 people that all showed a reduction in cardiovascular events. So it's pretty well established now with the most recent evidence that omega-3 fatty acid supplementation does indeed reduce cardiovascular events. But I want to focus on these two trials in particular, the Evaporate trial and the HEARTS trial, because I believe they really change our thinking about coronary disease. Now here's the results of the meta-analysis. That is a combined analysis of all those clinical trials positive and negative, and the sum total suggests that there is indeed a reduction in cardiovascular events. I've yellowed the, the squares to the left of the vertical line that suggests a reduction in cardiovascular events. But let's focus on these two clinical trials. Both involved something called CT coronary angiography, and all that means is the device used for generating coronary calcium scores, a CT scanner, was used and people were given an intravenous dye that allowed the coronary arteries to be visualized in great detail. I did a lot of these, uh, these um, types of tests about 15, 18 years ago, but since then, the software has gotten much better and allows you to quantify the various components of coronary atherosclerotic plaque. The soft or fatty components, that's the stuff that ruptures and causes heart attack. The fibrous components, the calcium and you can quantify them precisely. So in this clinical trial, the Evaporate, now in these two trials, everybody takes a statin drug because that's the prevailing standard in conventional care, even though I think it's ridiculous, that's what they're doing. Everybody takes a statin drug, but half get 4,000 milligrams of EPA, other half gets placebo. Now this was the pharmaceutical form, trying to turn food into a drug, but it's the same as the ethyl ester that you get at Costco, Sam's Club, or the health food store. Uh, why did they do that? Patent protection, not efficacy, patent protection. But anyway, 4,000 milligrams versus placebo in these people, and the people who got the fish oil, the uh, omega-3 in blue, had modest regression. The people who had only statin drug saw marked progression, that is worsening of the, uh, in this case, the soft elements of plaque. Looking at the fibrofatty, that is a mixture of fibrous tissue and fatty tissue, there was regression 
in people getting omega-3. There was progression in people getting only statin drug. Likewise, fibrous tissue, no change, statin alone, and a regression with addition of omega-3s. Now, there was no change in calcium, but I'll talk about that in just a moment. A similar trial, the HEARTS trial, in this case, 3,360 milligrams or 3.3 grams of EPA and DHA over 30 months. Everybody's on a statin once again, and then a CT coronary angiogram at baseline, then follow up at two and a half years. And in this trial, they did measure the omega-3 index, the RBC omega-3 index, which was low, as it is most Americans, 3.3%. So once again, non-calcified plaque, the softer kinds of plaque, there was regression in people who got the omega-3s in red, and there was progression in people who took statin drug alone. And total plaque, modest regression with addition of omega-3, progression with statin drug alone. Now, it looked as if people who got a blood pressure systolic of 125 millimeters of mercury or less were much more likely to enjoy regression. People who had lower triglycerides also were more likely to obtain regression. In my programs, by the way, we aim for 60 milligrams per deciliter of triglycerides. And for what it's worth, not a measure I use, but the non-HDL cholesterol less than 100 seemed to predict regression also. And people who enjoyed regression of their plaque had fourfold fewer cardiovascular events like heart attack compared to people who had progression. So two trials using similar methods showing that regression or reversal or reduction of the volume of coronary atherosclerotic plaque is possible with the addition of higher doses of omega-3 fatty acids. But I will point out this. Now, this is not a criticism of those clinical trials. I'm very grateful they did this. That those are tough trials to do. Uh, Matt Budoff, the, the lead member of that first trial, has done a lot of work in this area, has done an incredible job. But note that because you can only answer a handful of questions in these clinical trials, some things weren't included. So there was a lack of vitamin D. Had they added vitamin D, they would have seen a reduction in calcium, or at least a, a larger reduction in calcium, as we've been uh, achieving all the time. Addition of vitamin D was the thing that allowed us to drop coronary calcium scores dramatically. Of course, there's no attention to such things as iodine and thyroid status. Thyroid disease is, is everywhere, and it's a cardiovascular risk factor. Of course, no attention paid to magnesium that reduces blood pressure and improves insulin responses. And of course, no attention paid to the microbiome, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and lipopolysaccharide endotoxemia, major drivers of cardiovascular risk. So you can do these things, and you can do better than what they achieved, those two clinical trials. So you have tools that they did not use that further amplify your hopes of achieving regression of coronary atherosclerosis. Now I point this out, that a lot of the preceding studies, not the two CT coronary angiogram studies, but all those big studies of fish oil versus placebo, they had very serious methodologic problems that I believe that caused the outcomes to underestimate the benefits of omega-3 fatty acids. For instance, the doses, as you saw at least in the beginning, earlier studies, were too low. It's still not clear what proportion of EPA and DHA should be taken. EPA seems to be more important for cardiovascular protection, DHA for preservation of cognitive health, so it's probably best to get both. A lot of these studies don't tell us what form they used, like triglyceride or ethyl ester, or the phospholipid form. Of course, the icosapental ethyl is the prescription form, one of the prescription forms, or a monoglyceride. So this is another pitfall in some of these studies that you really need to know the form. Not knowing the form makes it a little bit more uncertain on the outcome. And of course, most of the studies did not perform, as they did in hearts, a baseline EPA DHA uh, RBC omega-3 index to show how much people had at the start. Because some people do eat seafood and have a higher level to start. But the biggest problem was there was no dose adjustment based on body size and absorbability. And that's a, those are big variables. So to illustrate, here are ladies who are given EPA and DHA, and you can see on the x-axis is weight. The heavier they are, the less the blood level of omega-3s go up. And so if you have a lot of overweight people, as there were in these clinical trials, 
you won't get a big rise in EPA and DHA. It'll be blunted because there's either poor absorption or there's distribution into the fat tissue, and you will have only limited benefits. But this, this problem plagues almost all the studies, meaning that the benefits of omega-3 fatty acid supplementation were likely underestimated. So one way to level that playing field is to know about this test, a simple RBC omega-3 index. I have no relationship with this company. It's just a good test. It's $49. It's a finger stick you do in your kitchen, and they test it for you. This tells you what proportion of fatty acids in the red blood cell membrane are comprised of EPA and DHA. So the average American is about 3.3, 3.4%. You want between 10 and 12%. So this is an easy way to validate. And does it matter whether you're taking the ethyl ester form, the very common ethyl ester form, or the more expensive triglyceride form? Because you can still get to the target RBC omega-3 fatty acid level of 10 to 12. I will tell you, however, that most people who take 3,000 to 3,600 milligrams of EPA and DHA in any form almost always achieve an RBC omega-3 index of 10% or greater. And this, this is a map that shows what the levels are throughout the world. In the U.S., we're below 4%. In countries like Japan and South Korea that have very few cardiovascular events, they're above 8%. So confirmation that higher levels seem to be associated with fewer heart attacks and other cardiovascular events. So we're going to aim for 10 to 12%. And that's where you get all those wonderful benefits, such as reduction in cardiovascular events, preservation of cognitive health, reproductive health for both mother and child childhood neurological maturation, and the maximum reduction in triglycerides that's important for management of cardiovascular risk. But always keep in mind, regardless what form of fish oil you choose, you can always adjust your dose if you choose to be guided by the RBC omega-3 index. So there you have it. The point here, the bottom line here is omega-3 fatty acids are effective in reducing cardiovascular risk, probably more than the studies suggest, and it's a critical component much more so than statin drugs, in achieving reversal or regression of coronary atherosclerotic plaque.